The complete guide to how to make pixel art like this using Blender. Today we're going to walk through the whole process, starting with setting up Blender to work with pixel art. We'll cover a few modeling tips, texturing, lighting, animation, and rendering. I'll also give some bonus tips on normals for 2D lighting and clean up in a sprite. I'm only going to focus on the parts that apply directly to the pixel art aesthetic. This isn't a full Blender course, but I'll link to some good general tutorials in the description if you want to dig deeper. With all that out of the way, we've got a lot to cover, so let's jump right in. The setup. Blender obviously isn't designed to give you pixel art by default, so let's change a few things first. We'll want to drop our render resolution to something that makes sense for whatever it is we're rendering. If you want to watch a fantastic breakdown on pixel art resolution, check out this video by Adam C. Yunus. I'm currently working at 128 by 128 to give myself a little extra room around the character for attack animations. You can use Eevee or Cycles for this, it's up to you. So if we render our scene now, we've got a nice retro resolution, but everything looks blurry. By default, Blender applies this pixel filter to avoid aliasing, but since we want sharp aliased edges, we can go into the render settings to turn this all the way down to zero. Now if we render, we basically have our pixel art look done. Simple. But while we're working, we can't really see what it looks like, and we don't want to have to keep hitting render over and over as we work. It would be nice if we can see our changes updating live. And to accomplish this, we're going to make a quick little setup in the compositor. The compositor, if you don't know, just takes the image we see in our viewport, passes it through some nodes, and outputs it here at the end. This output labeled composite goes to the render. So if the image just goes straight to the render with nothing in between, there's nothing being changed. But if we add a node in the middle, how about a node that flips our image around? and then we hit render again, uh, we still see no change. And that's because the compositor is completely ignored unless we check this use nodes box at the top here. There we go, upside down renders. But we don't want to change our renders. We were already happy with that part. We just want to affect the viewer so we have a live preview. So we'll make a viewer output node and use that instead. The compositor output just gets the unchanged image, no extra nodes in between. And finally up here in the viewport render settings, we'll turn compositor to always, and there we go, upside down viewport. So instead of this flip here, we want to achieve the pixel art look, so to do that we just scale down nice and small, and now we can't see it, so we'll just have to scale it back up by the inverse amount. Make sure our filters are set to nearest, which is essentially the same thing we did before with setting our filter size to zero. And voila, pixel art renders and a live pixel art preview. You'll want to play with the scale value here to match the look of your render, but you might notice a little problem here. As I zoom in and out, the size of the pixels is view dependent, which means if I zoom in, the pixels stay the same size on the screen, which makes the model look higher resolution the closer I get to it. So we're going to want to lock down our camera. I like to do this by making a floating window moving it to the side, lock all the camera transforms, and fit it to the view. This window just stays here the whole time while I work. Cameras. This is where things will start to vary wildly depending on your personal project. Obviously if you're making a 2D side-scrolling platformer, your camera is going to be down here. I'm making a top-down orthographic game, so my camera is going to be up here. I like to parent my camera to an empty so that I can just use the empty to rotate my camera around my object. My camera's type is set to orthographic, and then I just play with the scale until I'm happy with the size, and the rotation is really up to you. My camera's tilted down by 35 degrees, but you can just play with it till you find something that you like. 45 is pretty common, I was playing around with something in the 50s at first. I would just make sure you pick something and try to stick with it for consistency's sake. You obviously don't want different objects in your scene to be rendered with different cameras. And while it's true that one of the benefits of working in 3D is that you have the flexibility to change your camera later and you don't have to redraw all your sprites, I'd still recommend locking this down pretty early on so that you don't have to go back in and re-render everything. Outlines. One more thing to mention before we move on to modeling. Some of you may want outlines. I personally like to make my outlines in a sprite afterwards, it's just a few quick clicks over there and offers decent enough customization. 
But if you want to do it in Blender, that's definitely an option. There are so many different ways to make outlines in Blender, but I'm just going to show you a quick and easy compositor setup that gives you outlines like this around the silhouette of your object. If you need to fine tune your outlines more than this, check out this video by Levi, which is where I learned this technique. The setup is pretty simple. It's just two alpha over nodes and one dilate erode node. The alpha goes into the dilate, which then goes into the factor here. Then you plug that into this alpha over, and then your image gets plugged in down here. Make sure your background is set to transparent, or else this won't work. Now you control line thickness with the dilate. The background color is changed here, and the outline color is changed here. Now we plug that into the scale setup from before, and we have pixelated outlines. Now I'm going to have to go on a bit of a short tangent here, because it's at this next step that I think we hit a fork in the road. Modeling. This is where stylistic choice starts to become a question you need to ask yourself. Are you actually trying to make pixel art with 3D assets, or are you actually trying to make pre-rendered CG? They're two very different things, but they use basically the same techniques, and technically speaking this is pre-rendered CG. The key distinction here is that I'm trying my best to make my 3D look as close as possible to hand-drawn pixel art. But that's not the only possibility here. Games like Donkey Kong Country or Diablo, Mario RPG, Age of Empires, Killer Instinct, and many many more used 3D rendered down to 2D sprites just like this, but these games were trying to push the realism as far as they could with the limited hardware of the time. I love this look. Donkey Kong Country was my first video game I ever owned, and one of my favorite series of all time. I think it still looks great to this day, but we know that they weren't trying to capture the look of hand-drawn sprites. Quite the opposite, in fact. So it's here at the modeling stage where we really need to make that distinction for ourselves and ask, are we trying to mimic hand-drawn pixel art, or are we going for that kind of retro 3D 90s vibe, or maybe something else entirely? Since I'm going for pixel art, I feel like I need to think of my model the same way I would think about a 2D sprite. Thinking deliberately about shape design, clear, readable silhouettes, keeping things simple and avoiding noisy detail, working with a limited color palette. These are all things that we can do in 3D the same we would in 2D. The skills you've learned in hand-drawn pixel art transfer surprisingly well to 3D. In the shader editor, you can plug an RGB node straight into the surface to give yourself a black silhouette. Check if you have a distinct, readable, and appealing silhouette. If you can tell who a character is just by a pixely black outline, you're probably doing something right. Who's that Pokemon? Be careful with your object's thickness. At the pixel level, some really thin shapes might read as floating pixels. If you really care about jaggies, you're probably going to need to do some cleanup later in A-Sprite. But even at this stage, you can try to be a little more deliberate with your shapes to give yourself a bit of a head start and hopefully less cleanup later on. Now, just for the sake of completeness, I wanted to show the other end of the spectrum. If you're really not trying to imitate hand-drawn and maybe going for that pre-rendered CG 90s look, you don't really have to worry about mimicking any limitations or workflows. Just for example, here's a model I made a while ago of Dart from the greatest JRPG of all time. And here he is with our pixel look applied. Kind of looks like he's deep in the cathedral about to become... <sighs> fresh meat. Lighting and texturing. Again, more stuff that depends on the look you're going for. I'm probably going to stop the pre-rendered CG talk here, and if people are interested, maybe I'll make a separate video on that. But in this video, I'd like to focus on trying to mimic that hand-drawn pixel art look. So for lighting, actually I don't really want to use any lights. Similarly to hand-drawn pixel art, I want to deliberately pick which colors are my highlights, which colors are my shadows, and manually place them on the model. You can UV unwrap your model here and start painting directly onto it if you want really fine control of exactly where those highlights and shadows go. But I wanted to show you another method here. It's a really simple and pretty fun technique called gradient shading. It's used pretty commonly in low poly and mobile games because it's super performant with its tiny texture sizes. And if you want to learn more about that, you can check out this great video by Molten Bolt. But I'm going to be putting a bit of a spin on the technique, and instead of using actual gradients, I'm just using a palette that I found on low spec. 
If you go to lowspec.com, you can search through tons of color palettes made by very talented pixel artists. The one I'm using is the most downloaded palette on the website by Kerry Lake called Resurrect 64. To summarize this technique, you basically just take that palette and lay it out in a grid of colors, and this is the image you're going to use as the texture for every single object in your scene. Now for the actual painting part, you're going to want to go into the front or side view and then project your UVs from view. Now you just scale those UVs down and move them around your palette to color your object. If you want the top faces of something to have a brighter highlight color, you select those faces and move them to the brighter color. Similarly, for shadows, you just move those down to a darker color. I found this is a pretty fun and simple way to figure out the colors for your object, as you can just move things around and experiment, try different things. And again, if you do need to paint in finer detail, you would just kind of go the standard route of UV unwrapping and painting directly on your object. Now one last thing to mention here, under your render settings, down at color management, you're going to want to change your view transform to standard. This will ensure that the color matches when you bring it over into A-Sprite or your game engine or whatever. Animation. Not a ton of stuff to mention here, but again if you're trying to mimic that hand-drawn pixel art feel, then you're going to want to think like a pixel artist. Do you want to draw 60 FPS if you're doing it by hand? Probably not. To capture retro feel, I'd recommend putting keyframes on every frame, and then you control the overall speed of the animation with the frame rate. Keep it nice and low with visible steps, and I'd start with the bare minimum number of keyframes needed to actually communicate what this motion is. Then you can add a few more if you really want to make it look a bit smoother and more appealing, but I would say less is more here. Rendering. Depending on the kind of game you're making, this could be a pretty simple step or maybe a bit of an annoyance. For side scrollers, you kind of just hit render and you're good. But for a top-down, eight-directional game like mine, especially when it's an asymmetrical character, you need to render every single direction for each animation, which is a bit of a pain to do if you're doing it manually. This is where a little bit of scripting can come in handy. I'll put a link in the description down below for the script that I'm using. I'm still pretty new to programming, so don't judge me too hard on this. But basically it just takes your selected object and rotates it a certain number of times, rendering at each rotation. So if you want to use this, just select the root bone of your character or whatever the base of your object. Change the number of rotations here if you're doing a different number of directions, and then press the run button. It'll dump all the frames into a render folder for you to open up an A-Sprite. Now a bit of a bonus tip here if you want to do 2D lighting for your game. One of the benefits of working in 3D is you can get perfect normals for every single sprite, and it's pretty easy to set up. If you don't know what normals are, basically these funky colors just represent the direction that each part of our model is facing. So in camera space, a red color means it's facing to the right, green is up, and blue is towards or away from the camera. Getting a little technical here, but we want camera normals, not world normals. To explain it simply, we basically just want green to point up towards the top of the screen, not necessarily straight up towards the sky. So in the case of a top-down or isometric game, the normals would be rotated slightly to match with the camera. Thankfully, there's a really easy way to do this in Blender. You can just switch the render engine over to Workbench and use this matte cap for your shader. We'll turn off anti-aliasing and then change the folder so we're not overwriting our previous renders. And then I'll just run that script again. And now we're ready for A-Sprite, almost at the finish line. A-Sprite, here we are at last. You can open up all the frames into a single timeline to do our final edits. I've got the normals as well, so I'll open those up and paste them into a layer underneath. The amount of cleanup that you do at this stage is obviously totally up to you. But for me, I just like to scrub through and look out for any weird kind of stray pixels or pixels that kind of pop on and off, some particularly bad jaggies, and really just anything that catches my eye that could be improved by a little manual cleanup. Lastly, you'll probably notice that even though we went through the trouble of using a limited color palette, we have this huge grid of colors over here. Most of these, in my case, are from my normal map, but even before I brought that in, it looked like this. These are likely just a noise introduced at the render stage in Blender, and if you want to clean these up, 
you can load the same palette that you used for texturing and switch over to index mode. Obviously you can't do this without messing up the normal pass, so I'll have to export that out first, then delete the normal pass layer, and now I can safely apply my palette. Then I'll give it one final pass to check to make sure that A-Sprite didn't assign any weird colors here and there, which sometimes it does. And then we're ready to export our sprite sheet. We'll set the sheet type to by rows, fix number of columns, and then put the number of frames here. This will give a nice grid of all the rotations that we can bring into our game engine. The final result. And there we have it. I brought my sprite sheets into my game and set them up with 2D lighting. If you have any questions about this process or have any requests for more tutorial content, feel free to drop them in the comment section. Thank you for watching all the way to the end, and another special thanks to all the 1000 plus people who subscribed to me already. I can't believe how fast I hit 1k with just a few shorts and just wanted to express my gratitude to everyone watching who helped me get here. Thank you. Until next time.